Hey everyone, this is lecture 11 for POS 273 International Relations, an online undergraduate course taught at the University of Maine in the Political Science Department. And I'm the instructor, Rob Glover. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the United Nations. We'll be kind of finishing our, our unit on the United Nations. Um, and specifically, we'll be looking at calls for reform. So ways that the United Nations could change its mission or its institutional structure to better fulfill its objectives and address some of the most pressing issues in global politics. So whenever I talk about the United Nations and the ways in which it's um, deficient or it doesn't really live up to its mission, I feel it's important to remind ourselves of the importance of the organization. Right? Why is this organization indispensable and important? If it went away, if it did not exist, how would that change the nature of world politics? It's very easy to beat up on the United Nations, um, but we have to re remind ourselves of its importance and the really tremendous work that the organization does in a lot of respects. So then we'll look at some ways in which the UN might reform in order to better fulfill its mission, talk about some of the obstacles to reform uh, in all of these different dimensions, and I'll just close by briefly talking about some of the international events or changes um, in our overall international system that could make states more willing to engage in that process of reform. And that's really kind of speculative. That's something I'd like you to continue to think about uh, as you participate in simulations involving the UN or just think about the organization as a whole. All right. So the first thing I would say, um, so when we talk about the UN, and uh, I've done this in a number of classes, we lay out this bold, uh, kind of grandiose vision for what the UN is supposed to be. And then we oftentimes look at the ways in which different barriers get in the way, <clears throat> or it doesn't really um, live up to that grandiose mission. And that can be disheartening, right? And if we take a, a kind of a short-term view, it feels almost hopeless, right? It feels like there's these um, enduring problems in the world. The one organizational unit that can speak as a global voice and represent the international community seems almost by design uh, incapable of addressing them. But I really think it's important to take a step back and take a longer term view and recognize that the UN is a very important organization and is, uh, in some ways, I would say, a monumental human achievement. So I'm just going to read to you briefly uh, from your chapter from this week. Um, but I think he does a very good job of, of stressing that before he, uh, well, actually, after he gets into some of the critiques um, and suggestions of reform. The author writes, with all its achievements and shortcomings, the UN remains an indispensable part of the global community seven decades after it was founded. If it suddenly disappeared, that is, if its constituent parts were allowed to disintegrate, millions of people around the world would be worse off. That alone is sufficient cause for upholding and supporting the UN, yet engaging the significance of the United Nations and the possibilities for improving it, a few salient points should be kept in mind. And he goes on to talk about um, you know, some of the things that we have to think about uh, if we're going to make the UN a viable entity in the world. Um, but I, I feel it's important, right, to just talk about without the United Nations, what would we lack? What would we not have? The first thing I would say is an established setting for regularized diplomacy and negotiation. Um, so we've only had the UN for about seven decades. Prior to that, um, you know, we did have the League of Nations, but for much of human history, when negotiation and diplomacy are going to happen, all of those details have to be arranged. Um, if you want, you know, an analog, think about this whole discussion about the United States and North Korea and President Trump and Kim Jong-un um, potentially you know, meeting in Singapore. Because this is a kind of an ad hoc summit, uh, you have to figure out what are the what are the circumstances under which these two countries are going to get together? Uh, whereas if you had two countries that were integrated into the UN and into the international community, that experience would be regularized. You wouldn't have to create these sorts of you know, summits in order for that to happen. Uh, and for much of human history, we didn't have that. And we had a number of very close calls and sometimes actual conflict would break out just because the process of setting up diplomatic channels for states uh, and representatives, representatives of states to work out their differences was so complex that it was too time consuming to get those countries together to try and work out some option other than conflict. Um, so in a lot of respects, it's important to have something like the UN where 
states and representatives of states know that they can go there and uh, try to work out issues through diplomatic channels if there is a conflict or a dispute of some kind. It's also um, one of our most important settings for creating international law. Right? So if we're going to have an international legal system, uh, we need an organization which can create the expectations, uh, the legal frameworks for dealing with certain issues, and the UN provides that. It's a hub of expertise on some of our most challenging global issues and some of the global issues that really um, consume the uh, attention and interest of the global community. Um, so, you know, whatever it might be, education, public health, uh, the, the um, uh, challenges associated with climate change, the UN is really um, out there doing the work to figure out what is the scale of the problem and if it's not addressed, what could the um, potential impacts be and what are some ways that we can bring countries together to collaborate and cooperate on these important issues. So there's just a tremendous amount of knowledge and expertise embedded in the organization. And the UN also does a lot of direct service, right? So there's a lot of um, areas of global politics uh, and just, uh, you know, global issues that the UN is really kind of at the forefront of addressing out in the field. So that could be uh, public health, it could be in the environment, education, development, women's rights, uh, protection of children, addressing human trafficking, all of these issues, right? The UN is um, really at the forefront of addressing them with state support, obviously, and with the collaboration of states, but the organization itself has done a tremendous amount of good work. And that is, you know, those are some of the areas in which the UN has really been recognized for the great work that it's done. So organizations like, uh, you know, UNICEF um, and uh, UNESCO and all of these different sub-entities within the UN have been recognized for the great work that they've done. So um, it can be disheartening to look at the UN and think about ways in which it could be better or look at some of the ways in which the will of the international community is disregarded, particularly by major powers, um, but it's a very important organization, and if it didn't exist, the world would be less well off. So we're going to move to talking about potential areas for reform, uh, and some of these we've talked about a little bit already, some of them we haven't. Um, but the idea is that there are these areas in which it's known that the United Nations is um, you know, not capable of fulfilling its mission or it's fulfilling its mission in some sort of deficient way. And how could we take the organization and reform it in order to make it uh, more effective? So we've talked about the UN Security Council, and you're now actively engaged in a simulation uh, of what happens at the UN Security Council on two specific resolutions. And there's a number of suggestions for reform here. Um, one is reforming the organization to better ensure regional representation. So there, there are stipulations right now that um, among the rotating members, you know, certain country, a certain number of countries have to be from different regions in the world. Right? So there is this effort at regional representation, and embedded in the structure is a recognition that you want uh, the Security Council, which deals with global peace and security, to have some emphasis on ensuring that all of the world's regions are represented, um, but that's not necessarily reflect, uh, reflected in the permanent five. Right? And so the idea is that, well, if we're going to have these these permanent five countries with veto power, we want the powerful, uh, you know, kind of regional countries, the countries that are the powers within their region, to be represented. So we could imagine some way of reforming the permanent five such that you had uh, a permanent member in every region. There's also talks about enlargements, um, so expanding the uh, council beyond 15 members, right, to 21 or 22 or 27, uh, and that could actually uh, kind of increase the number of, of um, representatives from, from different regions of the world, give these countries a feeling as, as if they had a voice. There's been calls for reform to veto power. Some have said that we should do away with veto power altogether, that you shouldn't have, you know, five countries or however many countries we want to give veto power. Um, you shouldn't have these small set of global powers who can effectively um, veto the voice of the international com uh, community. Uh, but with all of that said, it is very unlikely that the current, configu current configuration of power uh, 
will change. Even if we enlarge the UN Security Council, even if we think about different ways that we can um, improve representation of different parts of the world, it's very, very hard to ask powerful countries to give up the ability to veto uh, the decisions of the rest of the council. Right? Um, so even though countries, some of them are P5 countries, uh, recognize the need for reform, it's just a very hard sell to say, yes, we're going to take this enormous power that we have in this global institution and give it up. So it's hard to think about the ways in which that might change, but there's a number of proposals on the table. And, and who knows, maybe you know, in 50 or 60 years, uh, we'll see a significantly reformed Security Council. We also talked about peacekeeping, right? Um, and though the UN is more active in peacekeeping and peacebuilding operations throughout the world uh, than it, it ever has been, there's a recognition that there are limits to what the UN can do. And sometimes the UN is slow moving. If there's a dire security situation, uh, you know, the UN uh, military apparatus is not really the actor that can step in and prevent it from escalating. Usually you need a state to, um, to, to move swiftly in those cases. So there's a number of suggestions laid out in your chapter for ways that we could, um, we could, uh, change this, that we could try to reform this. One is to enhance um, the support network and resources that those in the field receive, right? So it, it can be a little disjointed. The command structure can be a little unclear. Uh, and sometimes the, the um, resources are just lacking, right? They just don't have the material and equipment they need in order to be effective in these very difficult situations. And this is related to the fact that um, you know, it depends on the specific case and where the peacekeeping operation is happening, but oftentimes the support of member states is not there, right? There's reluctance to empower this entity that kind of operates outside uh, the realm of, of state military power. And so there would need to be a change in the support from member states. What we hear again and again, particularly in relation to unfolding crises, right? There's going to be a genocide or people are going to flee because of an unstable situation, there's going to be a refugee crisis, is that you need uh, an entity that can rapidly deploy peacekeeping troops to the area uh, in order to prevent that situation from escalating. And right now, the UN doesn't have it, right? So there has re repeatedly been calls for um, a rapid deployment capacity for UN peacekeeping. And that goes back right to the founding of the United Nations. There was this suggestion that the UN should have, um, you know, a, a rapid response force that they can deploy. And we just haven't seen that. We haven't really seen state support for that. One of the, the early suggestions um, with the UN, too, is that there would be this network of global bases, um, permanent, easily deployable UN forces that would operate out of these bases. And there's very little support for that too. You can imagine debates over, you know, where are these things going to be housed? Um, could they operate without the consent of a state in which they're, you know, going to be attempting to diffuse a situation or provide peacekeeping support, peace building in an area that's um, falling apart. And it's just very hard to imagine uh, a scenario in which that would be supported. Um, but Arguably, this is what needs to happen. If these peace operations, peacekeeping and peace building are to be effective, you would need some sort of structure like this. Um, <clears throat> and also for these unfolding crisis situations in which large numbers of people are, are at risk, you'd need some sort of rapid response force. Again, um, probably unlikely, um, not a ton of support from representatives of member states but a lot of things can happen over a few decades, and so perhaps there will be some significant change. Now, we didn't really talk very much about development. Um, one of the, the important roles of the United Nations is um, uh, ensuring economic development, trying to bring, bring uh, countries and the individuals within those countries out of extreme poverty. And their most recent effort in this regard is something called the UN Millennium Development Goals. Um, essentially, these were laid out in the 1990s, and then 2000 was kind of the benchmark year in which we were going to start trying to achieve progress towards these goals. But it was a very ambitious set of human development goals, things like um, you know, increasing literacy rates, increasing 
the number of um, students who are enrolled in elementary education, uh, improving infant mortality, improving access to uh, basic necessities like clean water, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a whole series of Millennium Development Goals that were incredibly, incredibly ambitious. And the idea was that by the year 2015, we would have reached these goals, um, and it was probably unlikely that we ever would. We made significant progress in some areas laid out by the Millennium Development Goals, but it was generally understood that this was um, designed to be unrealistic. Right? It was designed to be a challenge that the international community would have to try to scramble to meet, um, and hopefully that would marshal a lot of resources and a lot of time and expertise and energy. Um, but they were well known, right? The Millennium Development Goals became the language that most major international aid organizations and the UN Development Program were using when they talked about international development. And so the idea uh, is that we should build upon that enthusiasm and try to, um, you know, not give up on those goals because we didn't achieve them, but still utilize and harness that enthusiasm. <clears throat> There's ongoing debates about. Um, just the efficacy of international aid, right, is the best way to uh, provide for some of these countries in which uh, there's very high poverty rates and all of the things that come with poverty is the best way to, to help them to give them actual, you know, uh, money and resources, or are there other ways of doing this, or there are ways of stimulating investment and harnessing the private sector um, to come in and infuse those countries with, with the resources that they need. Uh, and those debates are unresolved, right? And that kind of limits what the UN Development Program can do. I think the UNDP is much more um, supportive of the idea of providing basic aid and support uh, for countries, whereas some of the most powerful member nations are much more focused on getting the economic structure of these countries right and empowering private investment to come in and do that work. Um, so what we will need is a more coordinated global effort to deal with development issues and some of that will involve sorting out what is the will of the international community um, as to you know aid versus economic reform and uh, attracting private investment uh, there's also and this is just a general truth about the UN is there's a lot of um, kind of sub entities of the UN that are created and potentially have overlapping missions and are competing for very scarce resources. And so there's going to have to be some sort of organizational shakeup to um, eliminate and do away with and consolidate some of those redundant entities that have sprung up over the years, achieved a mission, and you know ideally would have kind of faded into obscurity, um, but have have stayed on. And so thinking about the institutional structure in such a way that different entities within the UN or within global development efforts generally are not trying to duplicate effort will be really important. And then lastly, um, we did talk about human rights. Um, with regard to human rights, uh, reforming UN efforts, it's really the issue is not so much that we don't have the legal norms, the legal frameworks, um, institutions even that can monitor uh, compliance that can figure out when states are in violation of those human rights norms and those legal frameworks and um, report that out to the international community. Between what we have at the UN and then what we have in um, what we call NGOs, non-governmental organizations, things like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or uh, Transparency International, we have a pretty robust international apparatus for um, detecting when countries are in serious violation of human rights norms. So that is no longer really the issue. It's not that we don't have uh, an international legal framework, and it's not like we don't have the means to monitor compliance. The problem has always been implementation. The problem has always been states uh, taking that human rights framework, integrating it into their domestic law, and then actually uh, enforcing it, right? Ensuring that they're living up to those human rights standards, sometimes even on agreements that they have, have signed on to and, and are parties to, oftentimes, actually. Um, so what has to happen then is that we need to utilize the bodies that do exist, right? We have the Human Rights Council. We have um, something like the International Criminal Court, which can actually um, try international legal cases. We have uh, regional courts, of human rights 
uh, that exist over and above the state level. Um, we have them in Europe. We have them in North America. They exist um, pretty much on everywhere at this point. Um, but we need to utilize them, and states need to step back, and states need to give up some of the that um, power that they have over what happens within their borders and kind of submit to international legal authority, which is, again, very hard. It's easy to say that, and it's very hard for it to happen. So, um, so the UN, you know, has made tremendous progress in articulating what are the the norms, uh, the human rights norms that that we want to see, um, and laying out very specific legal frameworks. But implementation and uh, enforcement have been very difficult. So there are a number of obstacles to reform of the United Nations, uh, and we're not going to go into the different areas and what the specific obstacles to reform are. Uh, we'll just lay them out at a general level. So the first would be the preeminence of the nation state as the basic organizing unit of global politics. So long as there is the expectation that the state is supreme and there is no entity over and above the state that can tell the state what to do, then trying to get states to do things is going to be very hard. It's going to require massive mobilization of people within those um borders of those states and beyond to demand that these countries operate according to international expectations and international legal standards. Uh, it will require, in some cases, regime change, right? There's regimes that for decades have been defiant and um, not respected the will of the international community. And so that will need to happen. Um, but it will also require a shift in thinking about the nation state as this basic organizing unit and nothing that exists over and above it is meaningful or can tell a state what to do. You also have the issue of bureaucratic inertia, right? So we mentioned this with regard to development, but as I said, this is a, a broader problem with the UN. One of the reasons why the UN is sometimes not as effective as it could be is that you have a vast bureaucracy um, that uh, is much more enthusiastic about creating new structures to address emerging global problems than using the existing ones, right? So as new threats emerge, as new global problems are confronted, there'll be some new UN summit that results in the creation of some new task force, as opposed to creating a streamlined, um, really kind of well-oiled machine of a structure that operates, uh, you know, with, with limited resources or within its existing means to address these issues. And when you create all these separate bureaucracies, it can, um, it can kind of dilute the overall power of your organization. So there may need to be some sort of fundamental shakeup to the bureaucratic structure of the UN in order for it to be effective. And right now, that's, I think, one of the barriers. And more broadly, um, if the UN is to be effective, then the world's major powers and the citizens of those countries need to be supportive. Right? They need to recognize and affirm the importance of the UN as a global organization, even if it occasionally does things or um, calls upon states to do things that they don't want to do, that strike against their national interest. We have seen a lot of criticism of the United Nations in the United States, right? Uh, and a lot of um, critiques, particularly recently, you know, you go back to like the 2016 election of globalism. Uh, nationalism, not just in the United States, but around the world is kind of resurgent. And as a result, an international organization, a truly global organization that tries to exist over and above the will of any one nation, any one country, is going to have a hard time um, generating support. And so we've seen the UN criticized and we've seen um, you know, the United Nations even criticized by people uh, not just world leaders, but, you know, sentiment within countries will turn against the UN. And that needs to change. So um, part of that is like people need to recognize that the UN does a lot of good work and is important. Um, but it's also that the UN needs to make people cognizant of that. The UN needs to really kind of aggressively market itself as a solution to global problems uh, rather than, uh, you know, this, this faceless, slow-moving, bureaucratic global entity. So there's some pretty significant obstacles in the way. Some of them are baked into the structure of international relations as it currently exists. Um, some of them are more uh, 
uh, a function of where we are politically in the world right now, but there's some pretty significant obstacles. Um, what I would close with um, and, and what I would encourage you to think about is the fact that uh, none of these things are insurmountable, right? These have been used as criticisms. These sorts of things have been stumbling blocks to really significant changes uh, in our, our global politics in the past and could be again. Um, what's slightly concerning is the types of things that tend to make the world's countries um, you know, suspend really aggressive notions of self-interest to start thinking about working within international organizations. The types of things that motivate countries to behave differently in this regard are usually crises. We've seen these organizations emerge out of terrible, devastating uh, world wars in which millions of people were killed. We have seen international conventions emerge out of, um, you know, environmental threats so severe that they threaten life on earth. It is usually crisis or impending crisis that compels states to think differently about the value of international organizations. And so the question would be, you know, what is the crisis severe enough to make us um, empower these organizations to compel some of the world's major powers to really recognize the value of these organizations. And you could think about a variety of things. It could be, you know, um, uh, refugee issues like we're seeing uh, out of Syria right now. It could be the threat of climate change and perhaps even refugee issues emerging out of climate change. There's a number of island nations that, um, you know, if sea level uh, continues to rise, they simply won't be there anymore. And then you'll have hundreds of thousands of people out on the open ocean looking for a new country, looking for a new place to call home. And, you know, perhaps those are the types of things that would drive us to um, to change our attitude and our orientation towards international organizations. Uh, maybe it will just be a recognition of a different type of self-interest that makes room for cooperation and makes room for the valuable role that international organizations can play. But in the past, if history is to be a guide, it's usually some sort of um, terrible, terrible crisis. So um, I'll leave you with that. You know, maybe maybe you're more optimistic and you think there's ways in which this is generational and, and could change and, you know, younger people throughout the world have a different mentality. Um, but I encourage you to think about it. So we'll wrap up there. Um, the one thing I would note is that, um, so this is, this will be kind of our midpoint for the UN Security Council simulation through ICONS. And I am asking you to do a midpoint report. Uh, this is basically just kind of checking in on um, what your strategy was and how the first week of informal negotiations have been going. If there's anything that you intend to change, anything that's not working out as planned, things that you feel like you're learning as you interact with the countries in the simulation. Um, so the midpoint report, uh, that assignment is up on Blackboard. That's due Sunday. And then Monday, we're going to begin the formal negotiations in the UN Security Council chamber. Uh, and that informal negotiations that happens through the messages tab, that's going to close. And then anything that you do related to the simulation is going to happen publicly in the Security Council chamber. So you won't be able to have back channel connect, um, communications anymore. So just be mindful of that. Make sure you get your midpoint report in on time and I'll try to get feedback to you as quickly as possible so that you can use it in the second week of the simulation. And then next week um, we'll be dealing with bureaucratic politics and international relations. The reading draws down um, in this in this week. Um, so we're going to be talking about bureaucratic politics, international relations. You're just going to be reading a short snippet from Dresner. Um, and as you read I want you to think about how do bureaucracies shape outcomes? Um, so one of the arguments that you're going to encounter is that the domestic um, kind of uh, agencies and entities that deal with foreign policy and deal with international security can develop an organizational culture and a standard, operation, standard operating procedure that shapes how they interpret threat, that um, conditions them to think about the proper policy responses in certain ways. And I want you to think about those things. You know, what do we mean by organizational culture? What does it mean to have a standard operating procedure? And how can that be helpful in thinking about international security and international relations? And how can that 
um, get in the way? How can that be a hindrance in addressing some of these issues that we encounter in international relations? So um, we'll wrap up there. Remember to turn in your midpoint reports, and I'll see you all next week. Thanks very much.